Let's just take a moment and, uh, and pray. Uh, Jesus, as we gather uh, around your word today, we want to be present to the things that you want to speak. We want to acknowledge that you are always speaking. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, New Zealand as a nation is a relatively young nation. I think it's one of the youngest nations uh, known in the world, uh, particularly for our European history, but even for Māori history, it's not uh, a long history compared to others. Uh, across the Tasman in Australia, the uh, uh, First Nations people or the Aboriginal uh, community over there trace their history back for thousands of years. And obviously, the people of God, the Jews, also trace their history back uh, for around 4,000 years. And as part of a, a long history, there are often stories that are told. Um, so I, wanna, uh, I want you to talk to the person next to you and work out, for New Zealand, what are the stories that we tell about who we are based as a people, like as a nation? Some of you are looking at me a bit blank. So, what, what, are the, what are the big stories that we, that we talk about as Kiwis? What, what are the stories that define us as... And I should talk to the person next to you, and if you don't know, kind of go, I don't know, and then I don't know. I've got some ideas that I can share with you in a moment. So, but just have a chat with someone next to you, and just ask the question, what are the stories we tell one another about who we are? If you're wondering, I came up with four. So, you know. Well, that didn't take long for the, uh, the hum to drop a little bit. So, has anyone got any... Do you, want me to give you, do you want me to give you an example? Would that be helpful? All right. So, so you know, one that we inherited, all right, is Christmas. It's a story we tell within ourselves, our, our, our nation. Now, admittedly, the original meaning of Christmas has moved well away from what it first was when it was first incorporated here. But, you know, the, the, the big stories that we tell one another uh, about who we are. So, Christmas is one. Who's got another one? Rugby. rugby. <laughs> yep. There's lots of stories about rugby. Sorry? Sheep. These are not on my list, just in case you're wondering. All right. Anzac. Yes. Who said that? Right. Okay. All right. Anzac. That was one I had. Sorry? First flight. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. I didn't have that one, but yes, people know their history. Yep. So Edmund Hillary, yeah, that's another one. The what? The Great Shepherd. Oh, Kate Shepherd. I think are we talking about Jesus here or Kate Shepherd? So these are people. Yep. What are some others? The Treaty. Why Tonga? Yep. Pavlova. A bit of debate about that one. That could go across the Tasman, apparently. MIQ, yeah, that's a great story. Let's not go there. Some of us have PTSD from that one. But, but the stories that we tell, you know, so, so the four I have was Christmas, Easter, Anzac, and Waitangi. They were the, the ones that the big stories, but the others are there as well. So Edmund Hillary, the people, the conquerors, those who have gone before us. And so even in our short history, there are things that we look back on and we kind of, this is kind of moments or, or stories that we tell ourselves that define part of who we are. And I think we cling to some of those big stories like Sir Edmund Hillary and, and rugby and so forth. It's like because, you know, because it's like from a small nation, we punch well above our weight. I guess that's one of the things that we want to communicate, isn't it? Is that even though we're, we're little, we still beat Australia, right? That's what we want people to know. So some of the stories that we tell there. Well, we've been working through the book of Nehemiah for the last eight weeks. This is week nine. I know it's week nine because we're up to chapter nine. And uh, today we're going to see that uh, they reflect on their history as a people, of how God had been present through all of it uh, with them in their journey. And so the, a quick recap is the story of Nehemiah is Nehemiah is called by God to come and help rebuild the walls of the city. 
And, uh, and Paul, um, a few weeks ago, preached that you know, the, the first half of Nehemiah is kind of the physical rebuilding, but then the second half of Nehemiah, as we're going to look at today, is almost the rebuilding of the people of God. Who are they? What defines them? Uh, what makes them who they are? So we're going to uh, be reading through uh, chapter 9 together. Um, last week, Nate shared how the, the people listened to Ezra read the word of God for six hours as he read the law to the people. So I hope you've blocked out some time today because um, that was the example we were given. So six hours of spending time there. But there's something about six hours that we find in Scripture. It's the first quarter of the day. And it seems like this was a, a significant part of what they used to do. So let me read for you, starting at uh, Nehemiah 9, starting at uh, chapter 1. Sorry, verse 1. On October 31, the people assembled again. And this time they fasted and, and dressed in burlap and sprinkled dust on their heads. Those of Israel, Israelite descent separated themselves from the foreigners and they confessed their own sins and the sins of their ancestors. They remained standing in place for three hours. Now, some people have a problem when we have to stand for more than two songs. But they stood in place for three hours while the book of the law of the Lord of their God was read aloud to them. Then for three more hours, they confessed their sins and worshipped the Lord their God. That's a big chunk of time, isn't it? So the scriptures were read for three hours. And then the people confessed their sin and worshipped for three more hours before their God. And one of the things in Jewish society was that they had open confession. That was that they would just blurt it out. So they were standing together, confessing openly their sins of what they had done before God and to one another. One of the things that we find in modern Christianity is that we've made it so personal that we don't often confess sin to one another. We do it in private, alone with God. We might acknowledge some of our own, own fo- uh, failings and faults that maybe God has made aware of us. We might apologize for something, but is that the same as confessing when we have done wrong? But interestingly, in this text, the people not only confess their own sins, but the sins of their ancestors. How often do you want to take responsibility for someone else's actions? It's not something we gravitate to, is it? It's not something that we want to sort of go, yes, we want to take responsibility for that. Often it's challenging enough to accept our own issues, let alone the the sin of those who have gone before us. Do Do you have those moments when something happens in the world and it kind of cements in your mind what was happening at that moment. So if I, if I was to say, do you remember, for those of you who are old enough, where you were at 9-11 when the planes flew into the World Trade Center? Do you remember where you were, right? There was one of those moments where it's like just sunk in. I, I remember we were in Canberra and I was doing some painting in our house and I just kind of had the TV on in the background and it was my, my day off through the week. And... Uh, And I remember it so clearly because the Prime Minister of the day, Kevin Rudd, issued an apology to the First Nations people, to the community, for the stolen generation. And what that was, was that uh, a number of years beforehand, the children of the indigenous community were taken out of their communities and they were placed in the care of white families or institutions because they knew how to do it better. And even though Kevin Rudd at the time was no party to that decision at all, and successive governments had not responded or or made recompense about that at all, but he came in and he made an apology to the Indigenous community. And what that made what made that so powerful was that in the gallery there were the Indigenous community. And to see the impact of those words spoken. It just cemented what I was doing that day. Of here was someone willing to take responsibility for actions that were done way before his time. For governments that weren't even a party of his party, but acknowledged that there had been wrong. And it wasn't, I went and reread the transcript this week, and it's not that long, but it's powerful. 
It's powerful when those things are acknowledged. And so here we see the people of Israel acknowledging that, you know, for them, they were confessing the sins of their ancestors as they looked back over what had happened. So the people of Israel had separated themselves out. They were listening to the reading of the law where there was obviously some conviction around how they had failed to honor God, to obey the things of God, and they confess and worship God. There's a real sense that in this moment, the people are not just rebuilding the city, but they are returning back to God. It's not just about a physical restoration, but it's about a spiritual restoration. That They want to be God's people once more. They want to live in ways that honor God, seek to reflect that in their lives and their practices. So they've gathered, they've heard the law, they've spent time confessing and worshipping. And then the Levites, who were the priests, the priestly tribe, they kind of step forward and they pray a prayer over and for the people. Now I want to read through this prayer, which is basically the rest of chapter 9. And we're going to read a little bit and then I'm just going to give a, a little bit of a summary around each section as we go through that. And we're going to start at, at verse 5. Uh, where are we? Here we go. It says, Stand up and praise the Lord your God, for he lives from everlasting to everlasting. Then they prayed, May your glorious name be praised. May it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. Now, this is a, a really quite a significant statement just there at the end. You alone are the Lord. Because the Jewish people of generations had a practice of confession. And it was called the Shema. And this is what it says. Listen, Israel. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom forever and all time. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your might. These words which I command you today shall be on your heart. So even as they hear this statement that God is one, they are reminded back to the confession of the people of who they are called to be. Then it goes on to say, carrying on in verse 6. It says, You made the skies and the heavens and all the stars. You made the earth and the seas and everything in them. You preserved them all, and the angels of heaven worship you. So they are recalling back that their God, the God that they worship, is the God of creation. They're tying it back, right back to that very beginning, that that is who the God is that they worship, a God of creation. Then verse 7. You are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him from Ur to the Chaldeans and renamed him Abraham. When he had proved himself faithful, you made a covenant with him to give him and his descendants the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Jebusites, and Gugashites. And you have done what you have promised, for you are always true to your word. Again, they're tying their history back to Abraham. That they are the people who God has blessed through Abraham. And that God is fulfilling his promises through them. Verse 9. You saw the misery of our ancestors in Egypt. And you heard their cries from beside the Red Sea. You displayed miraculous signs and wonders against Pharaoh's, his officials and all his people. For you knew how arrogantly they were treating our ancestors. You have gloriously... Uh, you have a glorious reputation that has never been forgotten. You divided the sea for your people so that they could walk through on dry land. And then you hurled their enemies into the depths of the sea. You sa they sank like stones beneath the mighty waters. You led our ancestors by pillar of cloud during the day and pillar of fire at night so that they could find their way. This is tying it back again that they are a people who have been redeemed, been saved by God out of slavery, out of Egypt. And when they got to the Red Sea, God parted the Red Sea and they were able to walk through and be free. So all the time as this prayer has been prayed over these people of Israel, they have been reminded of who they are. They're also being reminded of who is their God 
He's a God of salvation who saves, who redeems. Then verse 13. You came down at Mount Sinai and spoke to them from heaven. You gave them regulations and instructions that were just and decrees and commands that were good. You instructed them concerning your holy Sabbath and you commanded them through Moses, your servant, to obey all your commands, decrees and instructions. Well, that's the Ten Commandments being given through Moses to the people. Verse 15, you gave them bread from heaven where they were hungry and water from the rock when they were thirsty. You commanded them to go and take possession of the land you had sworn to give them. If you remember the story of Israel is that God had promised them a land and he showed them the land. But then this is what happened next in verse 16. But our ancestors were proud and stubborn and they paid no attention to your commands. They refused to obey and did not remember the miracles you had done for them. Instead, they became stubborn and appointed a leader to take them back to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God of forgiveness, gracious and merciful, slow to become angry and rich in an unfailing love. You did not abandon them even when they made an idol shaped like a calf and said, this is your God who brought you out of Egypt. They committed terrible blasphemy. Again, a reminder that the people had failed to be obedient to God, but God showed his unfailing love towards them. Verse 19. But you in your great mercy did not abandon them to die in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud still led them forward by day, and the pillar of fire showed them the way through the night. You sent your good spirit to instruct them, and you did not stop giving them manna from heaven or water for their thirst. For 40 years you sustained them in the wilderness, and they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. Their clothes did not wear out. How many of you got clothes that don't wear out, apart from the ones that you don't wear? But God just showing his sustaining power for his people, even though, even though they had not been obedient to him. Verse 22. Then you helped our ancestors conquer kingdoms and nations and you placed your people in every corner of Israel. They took over the land of, the, of King Shion of Hezbron and the land of King Og of Bashan. You made their descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and brought them into the land you had promised to their ancestors. They went in and took possession of the land. You subdued whole nations before them. Even the Canaanites who inhabited the land were powerless. Your people could deal with the nations and their kings as they pleased. Our ancestors captured fortified cities and fertile land. They took over houses full of good things with cisterns already dug and vineyards and olive groves and fruit trees in abundance. So they ate until they were full and grew fat and enjoyed themselves in all your blessings. That's God leading them into the promised land where finally they fulfill the promise that God had given them. And then 26. So they've just received all the blessings and then they continue to pray. But despite all of this, despite receiving all the blessings, they were disobedient and rebelled against you. They turned their back on the law. They killed your prophets who warned them to return to you and they committed terrible blasphemies. So you handed them over to their enemies who made them suffer. But in time of trouble... They cried out to you, and you heard them from heaven, and your great mercy, in your great mercy, you sent them liberators who rescued them from their enemies. But as soon as they were at peace, your people again committed evil in your sight, and once more you let their enemies conquer them. Yet whenever your people turned and cried to you again for help, you listened once more from heaven. In your wonderful mercy, you rescued them many times." Verse 29, you warned them to return to your law, but they became proud and obstinate and disobeyed your commands. They did not follow your regulations by which people will find life if only they obey. They stubbornly turned their backs on you and refused to listen. In your love, you were patient with them for many years. You sent your spirit who warned them through the prophets, but still they wouldn't listen. So once again, you allowed the peoples of the land to conquer them. 
But in your great mercy, you did not destroy them completely or abandon them forever. What a gracious and merciful God you are. Verse 32. And now our God, the great and mighty and awesome God, who takes his covenant of unfailing love, do not let all the hardships we have suffered seem insignificant to you. Great trouble has come upon us and upon our kings and leaders and priests and prophets and ancestors, all of your people from the days when the kings of Syria first triumphed over us until now. Every time you punished us, you were being just. You have sinned greatly, uh, sorry, we have sinned greatly and you gave us only what we deserved. Our kings, leaders, priests and ancestors did not obey your law or listen to us, uh, listen to the warnings in your commands and laws. Even while they had their own kingdom, they did not serve you, though you showered your goodness on them. You gave them a large fertile land, but they refused to turn from their wickedness. So now today we are slaves in the land of plenty that you gave our ancestors for their enjoyment. We are slaves here in this good land. The lush produce of this land piles up in the hands of the kings whom, we, whom you have set over us because of our sins. They have power over us and our livestock. We serve them at their pleasure and we are in great misery. And in verse 38 it says this, Then the people responded, In view of all of this, we are making a solemn promise and putting it in writing. And that's in next week's message. But the theme that we see here the Levites have been retelling their history to the people. And the core theme of this is what? What is the core themes that you notice in that? For me, I notice that God is good. God remains faithful. God continues to bless his people. God is full of unfailing love and compassion. God gives all for his people. God remains faithful even when his people are unfaithful, even when we are unfaithful. Such a powerful image. Often people say the God of the Old Testament is all judgment and punishment. It doesn't really line up with the God of Jesus. Have you heard that statement before? Have you heard people say that? They obviously haven't read this text, have they? Because in this text, that's not the message. The message is that God is full of unfailing love and compassion and mercy for his people over and over and over and over again. And the people understood that they received, the, the, I guess, the, the punishment, the discipline of God as a result of their actions, not because God is harsh or mean. God listens when the people cry out. He saves them when they turn to him. It's an amazing uh, realisation that God is for them. He is a God who remains true to his promises. The covenant he made with Abraham that all people will be blessed through him. And this is ultimately expressed in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That all people can know a God like the Israelites knew. Who gives an abundance over and above. So what does this text mean for us? What does it mean for you and I as we, as we look at this here in the Old Testament of the people of God who have finally come to their senses and recognise who God is there? Well, there are some great reminders in here that we can take forward and they line up with the teachings of Jesus. The first is this. God's ability to forgive and restore is actually limitless. This is what we see in this prayer over and over and over and over again. God hears the cries of the people and he responded and he restored them. Can you imagine how often over 1,500 years the people cried out to God, save us. If you read through, through Judges and some of those other books in the Old Testament, you, you kind of get the thing. There was a king who came who was good and God blessed them and then there was a king who wasn't so good and then they, they went in punishment. And there was a cycle they went through over and over again. But every time they got to a low ebb, the people went, ah, oh, let's turn back to God. Let's turn back to God. And every time they turned back to God, God heard their prayers. And God responded with liberators and people and offered his blessing to them. 
And even though this people here, as I've stand around, as I've uh, rebuilt the walls, and, and Paul was reflecting this a couple of weeks ago when, when he shared, that they were standing in a city that wasn't overly populated. It was pretty sparse. The temple had been rebuilt, the walls had been rebuilt, but it wasn't a hustling, bustling place. It was still quite decimated. And yet they could still stand there and go, but God remains good and faithful and true. God is there in the midst of it. And that the Lord was not only rebuilding a physical place, but he was also rebuilding his people, restoring them for his plans and his purposes. I came across this uh, text as I was uh, doing my work through the week. Micah 7, uh, verse 18. Where is another God like you, who pardons the guilty of the remnant, overlooking the sins of his special people? You will not stay angry with your people forever because you delight in showing unfailing love. Once again, you will have compassion on us. You will trample our sins under your feet and throw them into the depths of the ocean. You will show us your faithfulness and unfailing love as you promised to our ancestor Abraham and Jacob long ago. That's an amazing text. Where is another God like you? There is no other God like Yahweh that we worship. There is no other God like that. A God who does these things. Again, God is expressing his grace, his pouring out of his grace to his people. If we move to the New Testament, in Matthew 18, Peter asked Jesus a question because Peter often asked Jesus questions. And he comes up and he thinks he's got a, 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 you know, this, this big question for Jesus. And it's like, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Well, this was Peter being generous because they were taught that three times was enough. When someone came and asked for forgiveness three times, that was it. You could then tap out and go, you know what? You've had your share. So Peter's thinking, I'm being generous. I'm going to double it and add one for good measure. And he says to Jesus, how many times? Seven times. And some of you would know this story. And Jesus' response is not seven times, but 70 times seven. How many of you are doing the math on that right now? If you are, you've actually missed the point. Sorry, Eddie. (laughs) The point isn't to get to the number. The point is to recognize that Forgiveness is limitless. The forgiveness, the opportunity to be forgiven and to forgive is limitless. Because we have a God who doesn't hold accounts against us. How often has God forgiven you? How often has God forgiven me? I can't keep track. If I count about how many times a day and then multiply that, I could come up with a really long list. But it's only as we are forgiven by God, through God's unfailing grace, his mercy, his compassion, that we actually then have the capacity to go, as we have been forgiven, so I forgive others. So today... As we sit in light of this text, as the people stood up and admitted that they had done wrong, as they confessed, as they recognized that, as they worshipped God, I want to invite each of us to come to the throne of grace and seek God's forgiveness first and foremost, because it's only out of that expression that we are able to look beyond ourselves. And it's in Psalm 139. And some of you would know some passages from the psalm. It talks about how wonderfully made we are, how complex we are, how how God has woven us together, how we can't escape the presence of God because God is always with us. But then there is this, this beautiful phrase at the end. And this is what it says, verse 23 and 24. It says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you 
and lead me along the path of everlasting life. One of the hardest things, and I'll just say this generally, for humans to do is the practice of self-reflection. That's why we like to keep ourselves busy. Because if we're busy, we don't pause, we don't listen, we don't contemplate. And I don't know about you, but I find it a lot easier to notice what's happening in other people's worlds and lives than sometimes what it is to see in my own. And it can be really challenging to be that vulnerable before God and actually ask God, would you search me? You know me. And I hope that you've heard from the text today that God is for us. Because sometimes the things that stop us approaching the throne of grace this way is that we are afraid of, or we have shame. We don't want it to be known, some of the stuff in our, in our world. But today, through the text of Nehemiah and through the psalm, I want us to take a few moments for self-reflection. That we would invite God to actually shine a light in our world, in our lives. That we'd be open enough to say to the Holy Spirit, would you reveal to me some of the things that I need, I need to be aware of? I'm going to ask the team to come up and uh, they're going to just play. I saw the example of three hours in here of worship and confession. We, we might see if we can get to three minutes. Just to pause. And sometimes the things that God reveals to us are things we expect, sometimes they are not. And as I mentioned earlier, part of our modern Christianity is that it's private. We kind of go, oh, well, God, God can do this and, and we might listen, we might reflect. And I want to invite you into that space of inviting the Holy Spirit because we know that the Holy Spirit is personal. To pause and to allow the Spirit of God to speak. And if you're not in that place today, if you're kind of like, I'm not up for this conversation with God at the moment, that's between you and God. And if that's where you are, you're free to sit and meditate on the things on your own heart that you want to focus on. I'm just going to open a prayer and then I'm going to just hand over to the team. I'm just going to play some light music behind so that you can sit. And then a few minutes, they're just going to lead us into our last song together. So let's uh, just pause for a moment. Holy Spirit, we know that you are present with us in our world. And as we've reflected on this text from Nehemiah 9, the, the reflection that you are a good God, that you're always present with us. We just go back to that psalm. Search us, O oh God, search me. Help me to notice the things that you, you want to highlight in my world and my life. And to be present to your grace in the midst of that. That we might be open to your leading. So Spirit of God, move amongst us. Through your unfailing love. Your grace and your compassion.